Next, I'd like to bring up David Culler, who is uh, EECS faculty and chair, as well as the uh, IFER Energy faculty director. David. All things wireless. There we go. So with that uh, visionary introduction, I guess I'll bring us down to earth a little bit as we dig into the, the rest of the day. <clears throat> and since Teresa is getting anxious about us being behind, I'll start a, a timer shaving four minutes off of my time. We'll see what happens. Um, so thank you. I'd like to welcome you uh, to this kickoff. Many of you we've seen here before and uh, represent uh, I for Energy. Uh, also, uh, Carl Bloomstein, who I guess... Uh, hide, there he is, hiding in the back, so uh, correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, so I wanted to give you a little sense of I for Energy and, and how it's changed over the years. Um, it was initially uh, formed uh, by uh, Paul and Carl and uh, Marianne Piet, some of the folks at the lab, as a way of kind of bringing these three communities together, in particular around peer and CEC activities. Um, which is to say that it began all about collaboration on, in tackling some of these very hard problems, um, and in particular, a, a message of uh, getting together to tackle problems bigger than what we could do on our own. Um, and, of course, in California, uh, we really do have some guiding principles that, that really help us lead the nation, uh, if you will. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the... Um, 2050 goals uh, driven by AB32 uh, and its follow-ons. And these are really tremendous technological challenges, social challenges, political challenges, you know, an order of magnitude reduction per capita in emissions. Um, and uh, recently, there's been a number of studies to begin to really look at the question of how do we put all the pieces together to get there um, from the California Academy of Sciences and others. And a, a key place where I for Energy um, uh, contributes to that, in my view, really is at this uh, second of the two findings, sorry, first of the two findings, that fundamentally we, we can put this picture together, and the biggest shortcoming actually is once you deploy deep levels of renewables uh, that are fluctuating, as Mother Nature has a way of doing, um, rather than dispatchable, uh, how do you firm those, uh, match them to the time-varying demand? Um, what they uh, referred to as zero emissions load balancing. So um, the mission overall, and this is part of the, what we tried to do is raise the sites and give uh, I for Energy some focus, really is a nexus for uh, a place to bring together the various activities focused on energy that have an information technology aspect, um, certainly within these three big institutions also being an information technology resource to amplify those activities and a, a structure to give some sustainability for the, um, for the research itself. And I, I'll touch on um, some of these aspects in, in the slides ahead. And of course, you know, the bigger agenda here is to make a trajectory on some of the things that, that Paul had on his slide. Um, while doing brilliant research focused on energy, with information technology really as a catalyst. And of course, that's the key. We're not gonna suddenly build a new set of 110 million buildings on this. We really do have to look at how do we reboot those things. And uh, information is um, very often the fastest way to do that um, towards these goals. So um, really the thing I think that pulls this community together and is quite unique is looking at the grid much, if you will, the grid carried the manufacturing mindset of a hundred years ago, you know, manufacture energy from fossil fuels, deliver it through a transmission distribution system to um, a demand on the other side. And really the question now is it needs to be a network. In some sense that transition from the industrial age to the information age. Um, and that means not only that you have feedback loops around the generation side, but within the consumption side um, to monitor, to model, to mitigate the demand, but also the ability to communicate across that structure, future availability of energy, uh, future demand and whatnot, so that these pieces can begin to work in concert. And if you will, I think the common element of the many projects that you'll see today is creating an information plane for a future sustainable energy network. 
So, you know, one more take on that. Um, if I were, we used to have, elect in the electrical engineering department, we used to do power systems. We got out of that business about 15 years ago because there wasn't any research left, and, you know, we're back into it big time. Um, I would view the classical view kind of this way, um, with, you know, perhaps a role of information around pricing or markets or things. And the change that we've seen going forward, um, if you will, well, of course, um, that's the physical plane. That physical plane is evolving, but we've introduced fluctuating renewables at each of those points. We've introduced storage of various types or utilized the storage we've had. We've recognized that there really is a whole new tier. It's not the big motors and appliances, but the humans on the other side of it or the industrial processes that those things are running for. <clears throat> and that the thing that will connect these all back together again and provide those critical feedback loops really is this emerging information plane. So with that kind of as the, the view of how this comes together, what Carl and I have tried to do uh, with Paul's support, Citrus, and future Becky, is to then try to organize ourselves, if you will, into a stack of research projects, reaching all the way. And, uh, you know, it's a blend. It's a subtle blend rather than hard. So we call this pastel. The colors kind of blur from one to another, all the way from policy, application, systems, translation, exchange, and linkages. So a lot of what you're going to hear today is in that bottom level, components, sensors, actuators, mechanicals. Those are the things that sort of easiest to get your head wrapped around. A lot of the other work that you heard about in Paul's talk is at the top, policy, but you're going to hear some pieces that start to fill in the, piece, the things in between. The uh, information exchange for access, representation of energy. These uh, notion of energy applications that walk into a building, there's an app for that. And really, these systems work in, in between. And you'll see some of that, for example, in Sasha von Meyer's talk uh, later today and, and Andrew Kirikov's talk on uh, portability for software in buildings and whatnot. So there's a wide range of projects. You're going to get a sense of it. I can't do justice to that here. So what I thought I'd do in the other eight minutes is just give you a point or two of an example of things in the middle. And this also has to do with leveraging. So um, for example, one key element in this was a National Science Foundation uh, funded project, LOCAL, about distributed energy and storage and recognizing that all energy solutions really are local. And of course, we want to use less calories, and, uh, and it's Cal, of course. <laughs> but um, really, the idea there, um, maybe the, the two, one of the two most important ideas come out of it, um, the way societal infrastructure evolves is always as an overlay on what existed before. Uh, the internet emerged as an overlay on the phone system, and then when it became established, dropped down inside. If you look at our modern logistics supply chain, you know, FedEx did not invent the airport. Um, it was built on top. And so this really was about creating the intelligent energy network as an overlay on the existing grid and internet. And it's very interesting. If you measure everything, you can talk about building a virtual private grid, and that was the sense of it, connecting some arbitrary set of uh, managed, dispatchable, and renewable slot supplies to some demand, say the entire campus or all of the UC campuses or the campuses in the lab, which, by the way, constitutes about 2% of the energy spend in California. Um, and if you're monitoring where every electron started and ended, it's OK that they squirt out the sides. You can still talk about how you did matching throughout something like this. The other one, a uh, technological result of the project, really was the universal representation for physical information, that if we're going to bring all of this stuff together, uh, much like the web, much like IP created a narrow waste in the internet hourglass, uh, all sorts of different physical information made available for all sorts of different purposes in a homogeneous kind of way. And a variety of technological uh, efforts and this wonderful uh, exercise with the lab, with other groups, of repeated application of the early stage of the technology to get it better and closer to right, really building an ecosystem now that brings in just about everything. 
uh, tons of stuff on buildings. We have uh, dozens of buildings. We have thousands of sensors in some of those buildings like this one. We have all of the ISOs in Northern, California, uh, Northern America and we threw in Europe for good measure. We have weather from every zip code that has a solar panel in it. Um, you name it, we've got it. About 100,000 feeds um, and doing that at scale and something that really can move forward in a really simple um, uh, standard, if you will, the kind of de facto standard that real people create rather than um, these very complicated processes. Where did that get used? For example, it became the core as we tried to disambiguate the megawatt this building consumes in order to isolate the hundred and some kilowatts of that, that's the office, not the fab, so we could shed 30% of it in automated demand response as part of a DOE Siemens project and build that all together. Um, to curb 30% of that in the peak of summer and whatnot. That created the infrastructure for doing things like personalized automated control. All of a sudden, control your lights from your phone, your laptop, whatnot. We save 60% of lighting energy use in this building while make it considerably more usable. The grad students no longer had to run across the room to push the button to get another hour or two of light. Yes, they do work after the sun goes down. Um, that move to personalized HVAC and whatnot and really starting to create this kind of ecosystem. And you'll hear more about that in uh, Andrew's talk this afternoon. Um, it, it's really amazing now. You know, you get feedback. You learn what people wanted in the schedule. That feedback goes all the way up to Domenico through the portal at the top, which I noticed is maybe not as well supported as it used to be. But he'll, uh, I have to say Domenico, our building manager here, has been instrumental in this idea of moving technology forward in the real uh, environment. Yeah, it deserves a, <laughs> deserves a hand. Um, in fact, this, is, this blurring of facilities and research is a phenomenal thing. Um, a new thing shooting out of it really is software-defined buildings. Um, really looking at the building as the thing that mediates the energy environment, the personal environment, and the outdoor environment. And for every physical building, there needs to be a cyber building. And what would be the operating system for such a thing? How do we make that a robust, viable, and secure platform for software innovation? So you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, let me just give you an indication of looking forward, looking out the power of the data. So I said we, we grab about everything. This is a year in the California grid. Uh, it's two years ago when uh, the CPUC first started re uh, releasing this data, broken down by source of generation. These are daily averages. Um, you know, of course, we all know the concerns about the duration curve and that uh, critical piece of capital investment that uses a tiny fraction of the time. And of course, that drives much of the demand response. So you might ask, for example, what if you took all of the renewable resources we have today and just scaled them up, say, to where they generated 60% of the current demand? What would a year and a 60% grid look like? Well, it looks like this. The green is excess relative to current demand. Of course, the plants have known this for a very long time. All of a sudden, that critical uh, cooling load in the summer, forget it. We got copious. Uh, excess energy in the summer. It's that nighttime winter load. Actually, it's the same problem Korea has. Um, this is how it breaks down. If you overlay the segregation of use by segment and you talk about now where should we be devoting our resources. So, um, for example, as we start getting into looking at things through this energy information lens, let me show you an example. This is the breakdown of those commercial building sources of consumption, the horizontal axis, so for start, the um, size of the circle is the amount of energy consumed. The horizontal axis is how much does the consumption correlate with natural gas usage? And the vertical axis is how much does it correlate with the peak 10% of the duration curve of those fossil fuel resources. So today in our 11% grid, depending how you count the renewables, cooling stands out there as the thing to go after. Um, and um, uh, interior lighting, for example, is, is not going to pick up very much. If you crank that up, at 30%, it changes a little bit. 
as you go to a 60% grid, it's a completely different picture. So this is to say that this ecosystem of supply, consumption, buildings, transmission, generation, renewables, portfolio management, over these next decades will evolve together. So that's asking the question generally, how do we make this infrastructure more, trend, more agile um, so it can accommodate these changes? We've looked at, in the case of the consumption side for buildings, how do we transform them into fundamentally more agile machines? Corbusier says buildings are machines we live in, or at least we work in, one of each. Um, how do we make them programmable? How do we separate their primitives from the applications? How do we tailor them to the use? How do we make them good citizens of the grid? Um, so you'll hear about later on a notion of the building operating system and services, uh, essentially to begin to structure it like we do large-scale information systems, uh, creating a hardware presentation and abstraction layer, various historical capabilities, paying attention to security and robustness from the beginning. Um, let me do the one-minute version of this. I'm actually on time. Um, here's a picture of our preliminary proposal for BOSS, which is a little too complicated to explain in such a venue. But the idea is, at the lowest layer, all sorts of different information feeds. Everything from the web and modern low-power wireless sensor networks that you'll hear more about, to good old-fashioned BACnet and OPC and Modbus and 485 and the stuff that's... We sweep all of that stuff, we drop a little black box about two inches on a side like any other little Linux thing these days to solve that problem and raise it up to uh, essentially an internet service. That's the SMAP hardware presentation layer. Out of that, a variety of higher level services so that you can think about applications like demand response or personalized automated uh, control. In this building, for example, we swept up the Apogee Insight through its BACnet IP and the Watt Stopper, uh, built this higher level, and I, I touched on some of these occupant-driven control and whatnot. Therese will tell you more about demand response. Um, given that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about wireless sensor networks, I thought I'd throw a nice little example in. Suppose you wanted to move this forward to, say, demand-controlled ventilation. Happens to be in Title 24. Too bad hardly anyone implements it. Mm -hmm. Throwing the CO2 sensors everywhere wirelessly is easy. Connecting them actually into the control system on the building, well, priceless, I guess, hard anyways. So um, uh, how would that look here? In this case, we're throwing in, we've just deposited, um, we'll hear a little bit more about the Korean microenergy grid, uh, a few hundred of these around, uh, sweep up the calendar and whatnot, for a demand-controlled application, which would live up there in the top. Um, here's a little example of it. You know, first thing you do for all the meeting rooms is sweep up the, sweep up the calendar, because they all have one of those. Um, basically, we'll manage them to proportional airflow based on CO2 levels, mm -hmm. demand-controlled ventilation. Um, so for example, freshen them up before the meeting. Would have been nice in here. In fact, it'd be nice if it would kick in around right now. You notice, getting a little muggy. Um, and then you modulate it to control during it. Um, of course, you know, not every meeting is scheduled like this one. So, you know, when CO2 gets high, um, freshen it up anyways. Uh, here's an example from one of the conference rooms. Here you can see, like everything else in these overventilated buildings, the uh, red there at 220 um, uh, CFM is us blowing air everywhere throughout this building. Um, the blue is the CO2 level. Uh, the black line there is the 800 parts per million. Even though we're blowing all this air, we still violate that. Um, throwing in demand control ventilation, here's what the picture looks like. Um, you see that by and large, the ventilation rate has dropped tremendously, especially when there's nobody in there breathing out. And uh, the violations have disappeared. Um, and the energy efficiency, well, you're saving almost 85% of fan energy for something that's healthier. So you really can align these two goals. Um, so you'll see today a whole palette of interesting projects like that. And I think it's, it's now just really fun to be working with I4Energy and Becky. And I think we're under time. Great.